Coming up on Digital Music Trends 187 on the 12th of June 2014, a very special show completely dedicated to the Brazilian music industry with guests from the Brazil Music Exchange, Delira Musica and the ABMI, as well as Som Libre. We chat about the evolution of the music market in Brazil over the past 20 years, the importance of local catalog and of the independent sector, the opportunities on the digital front, the YouTube conundrum, exporting Brazilian music around the world and of course the effect of the upcoming World Cup and the 2016 Olympics on the music sector. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Lionelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and DMT is available on a variety of channels as a video and audio show including iTunes of course, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud and many more. And if you'd like to receive a weekly mail out on what's going on at DMT and all the various shows I put out during the week you can sign up on bit.ly slash DMT list or tweet at Trends, and I'll sign you up. Uh, uh, directly and uh, this week it's a very special episode as I got three fantastic guests uh, with an amazing expertise of the Brazilian music market so uh, first of all it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, Luciana Pegore uh, uh, to the show uh, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing all the names today so uh, bear with me and uh, Luciana is an executive director of the label Delira Musica Brazil and president of ABMI which is the Brazilian Independent Music Association equivalent to those listening in the US or UK to A2IM or A so hi Luciana, thanks for joining us. How's it going? Well, thank you. It's fine. Everything's fine. Great. It's great to have you. And uh, on this yeah. episode, we also have uh, Martelo Soares, uh, the CEO of uh, Som Libre, uh, Brazil's the biggest independent label. So thanks, uh, Martelo, for joining us. Uh, how are you? I'm good. Thank you, Andrea. Nice being with you guys here. It's great to have you. And Som Libre is a, is a very uh, special independent as uh, it goes head to head with the majors in terms of market share in Brazil, but more on that uh, in a moment. And the third, it's great to welcome uh, Robert Singerman to the show. Robert is a global music business uh, consultant with an astounding amount of experience. He currently works on his own project, uh, Music with Subtitles, as well as working with a variety of uh, other companies and also heading the Brazilian Music Exchange in North America. So hi, Robert, and thanks for uh, joining the show and helping me organize it as, this as well. Thanks very much. Pleasure to be done with all of you. It's great to have you. And so, uh, you know, today's show is quite ambitious. And we, uh, if we were to cover everything that I set out to cover, we'd take a several hours of conversation. So we're going to have to condense it uh, quite a bit. But hopefully, in the next hour or so, we'll get to chat about the evolution of the recorded music sales in, in Brazil, uh, the impact of digital, the independent sector, copyright, and legal issues, uh, and of course, the upcoming World Cup, uh, which is uh, also a good reason to do the special as well. And so, uh, Marcello, uh, Marcelo, I'd like to start with you. So, Some Lever is a company that uh, has a rich history and got started actually back in 1969. So, uh, you know, you, you joined the company in the early 2000s, but uh, even before that, what was your perception of the Brazilian music market uh, uh, before, you know, the, the big changeover uh, in, in the year 2000 with the sort of digital revolution and, and everything else? Uh, how was the market organized and uh, where, it, where were the, the lion's shares of revenues coming from in Brazil? Well, uh, I cannot say much about uh, the market uh, uh, before I joined the company. Uh, sure. My experience with uh, Son Livre is pretty much the, my first experience uh, in the music industry, oh, music market in Brazil. So uh, before that, uh, my experience was pretty much uh, as, a, as a fan and as an amateur uh, a musician sometimes. So, Well, that's actually uh, a great perspective to have. So on your end, how did you consume music before, uh, before 2000? I was, I've been always a, a big consumer of uh, records, uh, LPs and then CDs and uh, uh, physical, physical products pretty much since my, my teens. Uh, so, I mean, uh, music for me was a big hobby, was a big part of my, my whole life, but uh, never actually uh, thought that I could use it, or that I could work with it at some point in my career. Uh, my career was uh, in totally different industries, as beverage industries, logistics, uh, telcos. So suddenly, in this was uh, 10 years ago, I found myself uh, at Global, the, the uh, global organizations in Brazil, the largest media group in Brazil. And I entered the company pretty much to, to, to work with uh, content of Global for cell phones. And ringtones right. was my, my entrance door for the whole music business. Uh, from Global.com, I came to, to Son Livre and then I started to, to understand a little better of uh, how the, the market, the Brazilian market of music is organized. And uh, well, I've been here for seven years. What I can tell you is that there's been a, a 
after a big change in direction in the in some livers business and uh, yeah. and activities the company was uh, organized as you as you mentioned in 1969 45 years ago mainly to put out soundtracks for tv global and compilations that could be sold in, uh, in conjunction and connection with uh, tv global shows uh, the big change in direction that happened in these last years was that with uh, the weakening of uh, a few of the majors in Brazil, and at the same time, with the weakening of the sales in the compilations, and right. uh, this was something that really happened with the the, the spread of the of digital music and digital consumption, uh, we saw uh, an opportunity and a need of going into being a regular label of artists, and then we we started to, uh, to hire. Uh, considerate uh, uh, amount of uh, artists and to build a strong roster today but I would say that uh, uh, we we probably well not probably we definitely have the, the strongest roster so roster of Brazilian artists and uh, we rival Sony and Universal in Brazil in market share so uh, the, the country today is pretty much concentrated on those three companies that probably have around 60, 70 percent of the market. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, Luciana, to, to ask about your experience uh, uh, with uh, uh, Delira Musica. Uh, so uh, you s set it up in 2003. So it's quite a brave time to set up a record company, given that in 2000 uh, there had been a massive drop in, in record sales in Brazil. I'd rather, uh, you know, just yeah. in between 2000 and 2001 alone, there was a 27 percent drop in, in uh, audio music sales, uh, uh, possibly given by the, you know, the, the, the rise of Napster and, and other me methods of consumption as well. So uh, how did you end up setting up uh, Delira Musica at that time? Time, uh, that made you optimistic about the future of the music in, uh, music industry in Brazil and uh, how do you feel about the, the years that came before that, that brought this change? Mm, yeah, no, actually I saw an opportunity because I, I used to work for Warner Music since 1996 and before there, that I worked for a promotional, for a producer company the broad used to bring, or they still do, uh, bring big orchestras and jazz concerts. And at Warner, I used to be a classical and jazz label manager. Right. So when the, the company is starting uh, shutting down departments and starting to focus only on, on pop artists and international artists, and, and my uh, passion was for classical and jazz, I saw that was an opportunity to have my own company, not for delivering only CDs, but, but tour, touring concerts and everything that, that had to be with that type of music. Right. Uh, and because I had, I used to be a flute player also, so I have many friends, musicians, great musicians, and they all needed someone to take care of their, of their work. So we started the company uh, by having product service, and a, a cultural department that uh, worked with sponsorship and because in, in Brazil we have a, a law uh, at the, min the Minister of Culture uh, where classical music and, and jazz and this type of music have a discount on income tax from the, the big companies. Right. So it would be easier for us to get sponsorship for this type of music. So I, 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 bought, I brought all the, the experience I had in, in production and in the music market, the recording music market, to build a company like that. That's great. And then afterwards, I started as a, a member at ABMI, then I became director at the board. And then I became president. And actually, today I, my role is managing director of the, the ABM of ABMI. Okay, great. And I, yeah. And well, before 2000, the market was pretty much major companies. And then when CD selling start, started to drop down, many independent labels started to to appear especially coming from producers and artists that they became independent from the major companies and and the role of the major companies 
started to be only distribu distributors of CDs uh, instead of producers and, and recording companies, really. So this changed a lot That's from super 2000 today. Yeah. That's super interesting because also it kind of highlights also the, the shift in priorities and investment, I guess, of the majors uh, at that particular time when they probably started investing more into their home territories like the US or, or in maybe the UK and maybe, you know, there was a window of opportunity there for independent labels to come in and, and develop more. Uh, Roberto, on your mm -hmm. end, so uh, where does your passion for Brazilian music, music stem from and, and when did you get involved in, into, into that industry? Uh, so how, how far back does your experience go there? Well, it's only a few years now. Um, the Brazil Music Exchange is a project of Brazil Music and Arts, which is um, a project of Apex, which is the Brazilian trade office. They deal with trade, everything from steel, biofuels, fashion, movies, etc. Yeah. Uh, I come from a um, music business background and artist development and labels and um, as well running export offices. I ran the French Music Export Office in the U.S. for five years and the European Music Office, which was an EU European Commission project for three and a half years uh, as well at the same time as I was running the French office. Uh, so um, in 2000 and end of 2008 I stopped working with the French office really to focus on uh, giving music legal lyric translations or in essence subtitles uh, so right. we can understand songs across language. And Brazil um, was a country that for me, growing up, I listened to a lot of Brazilian music with the context in English. Uh, I didn't speak Portuguese, I still don't speak Portuguese. Yeah. Um, so I was able to understand not only the lyrics, because a lot of them were translated at the time in the liner notes, uh, the albums that my parents had, but also the context, the understanding kind of the history a little bit of the Brazilian music, Bossa Nova, Tropicalia, uh, Samba, and really what the lyricists were writing, what the songs were about. And the songs were as powerful to me as songs of, of the States or of the UK or of uh, you know, blues and, and, and the vocals and jazz as well, because I could really understand the, the change that Brazil was going through. Yeah. So, so I was really uh, asked to run the Brazilian Music Exchange in North America, mainly because of my experience in import-export of, of music. Um, and uh, they were, you know, open to the idea of translations because really they probably more than any other country besides Japan from incoming music the exporting uh, Brazilian producers did care about the rest of the world enough to actually focus and give their songs translations as well as adaptations not necessarily yeah. direct translations um, so that the rest of the world can understand which I think is one of the reasons that Brazilian music is still strong around around the globe because people have an idea of, of what the poetry is, what the songs are about, uh, the, you know, the power of the songs besides just the, uh, the, the music, the melody, the harmonies, uh, but, but really the, the lyrics as well. But yeah. In Brazil, the lyrics, lyricists came from pretty much a different class of people at, at a certain point as the musicians and they, they combined together to, uh, to really change the change the the government change the world change the what, what people were singing about uh, so so for me um, working with Brazil has been a pleasure and, and an honor and uh, I've been learning more and more about Brazilian music all the different genres all the different uh, music coming from the different rhythms of, of Brazil and of Africa and of the Caribbean uh, before that and a little bit of the history of Brazil you know I still have uh, a lot to learn um, but it but it Brazilian music seems to be doing better and better globally uh, over the last few years, um, yeah. uh, as far as far as far as I can see, and um, I think it, it will continue to do better and better, especially as as people get to understand um, the songs of Brazil more yeah. and more. Yeah, sure. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about export uh, later on in the show. But uh, uh, first of all, I want to talk about digital. So digital, uh, Br uh, Brazil is an interesting country when you look at digital because uh, uh, things haven't quite worked in the same way as we've seen in North America or Europe. Uh, for example, downloads were really uh, almost uh, non-existent until about three years ago. And, and those have started to grow exponentially from then. Uh, you've seen like an 80 or 90 percent, 87 percent growth in the last three years, which is amazing. And, uh, you know, streaming has, has come in as well. 
uh, with YouTube and Vivo generating revenues uh, and we also have uh, uh, streaming services now live in the country uh, too so uh, Marcelo for, for, for you uh, how have you seen the evolution of digital over the last five or six years uh, come about in Brazil and what has really uh, changed uh, as far as, as the market well, uh, there's been some some good news and some good advancements in the market for for the digital uh, business. The thing is, we're still we're still very late uh, in in uh, many aspects of it. Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, iTunes was only released in Brazil in 2011. That's been uh, only for two and a half years now, and uh, so uh, we were pretty much eight years late uh, compared <laughs> to the initial release of iTunes in the U.S. and uh, 14 to 15 years late w w compared with the release of Napster right. in the market. So uh, the, the, the amount of time that we have to, to recoup now and uh, the change of habits that we have to work on uh, the general public to, to make people understand that uh, digital music is something that uh, may and needs to be paid for uh, it's it's very it's very hard it's a very hard change of habit because you have a whole generation that pretty much uh, grew up uh, imagining that digital music is something for free and not right. because they wanted the music for free but because they had no other way of paying for the music so uh, it's been like many many years that we have to to, to recoup now of this uh, tardiness in the release of an official uh, download service yeah and still now I mean iTunes is in place for two and a half years uh, but still in Brazil today we're in the middle of 2014 uh, iTunes is not available to for local currency if uh, Brazilian public needs to to and once a Brazilian person wants to buy a download of iTunes, he's gonna need an international credit card and pay right. dollars. So uh, you have to to remember that less than five percent of the population have access to to an international credit card. So yeah. this is pretty much the penetration that the downloads uh, have now in Brazil. And, so and are there alternatives, uh, alternative stores that people can no, buy downloads? No, not for downloads. Right, not for downloads. You have a few a few nice options for uh, cell phones. Uh, in terms of uh, still, we're talking about full tracks. Some some kind of. Uh, a package subscriptions for some uh, cell phone uh, uh, operators, but they're so small, there's not something uh, without scale to, yeah. to be relevant in the market. That's, that's very interesting. Uh, so, Luciana, uh, how do you feel about uh, uh, the, the evolution of digital in Brazil? I mean, the interesting thing is that, uh, as Marcelo was saying, uh, we're seeing that downloads and streaming are coming hand, hand in hand in Brazil, uh, whilst, in, in, you know, for example, here in the UK, we've had you know, 11 years of downloads and then now they are starting to sort of uh, 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 fall off the cliff. You know, people are starting to switch to streaming. And so you kind of have an evolution from one system to the other, but now you have both systems that are coming into play at the same time. So how, how do you think that's affecting the way people are, are approaching digital music today? Mm -hmm. Well, it's still really early to see. I really believe people will um, adopt some any of the services that are available. Um, but it's complicated because we have, like Marcelo said, a whole generation is not used to buy music, not physical CDs or downloads or anything. They're, they just get music in the internet and that's the way they think music should be. Um, but I believe that the services are there and, and if they promote themselves to this public and because the services are so nice and so good i think yeah. people will adopt adopt it it's cheap it's not really a problem so we're pretty uh confident that we'll turn around this um crisis in the market yeah. and we'll get people to buy digital music because the physical market is dropping down really fast right now Right. Yeah, it's it's continuing to, to to fall. And so, uh, Robert, mm -hmm. uh, Robert, on your front, uh, we've seen Spotify actually quite timely uh, just launched uh, in Brazil. Uh, uh, you know, just a few days ago, uh, and just in time for the World Cup, I guess. And so, uh, what do you make of Spotify's entry in the market, uh, considering that there are already several uh, streaming services that are available in Brazil uh, today? Well, 
Uh, probably Luciana and Marcella would know more about than, that than I do because they're there and they know the prices and they know the marketing that's happening. Uh, you know, for me, of course, the rest of the world does want to enter the Brazilian market because it's a huge marketplace. Uh, uh, you know, RDO has been there for a little while. I believe uh, Deezer's there, right, Lucena? Yeah. Deezer's there. Yeah, yeah. yeah Deezer's, Deezer's there. Here. Wow. And, uh, but, yeah. you know, I, I, I also, you know, work with a, a new streaming company called Playmo that's trying to change the model a little bit and make it less expensive on the subscription level than RDO and um, uh, Spotify. But has Spotify come in lower price than RDO in the market, Marcelo and uh, Luciana? It was pretty much the same. Oh. Uh, Spotify same launched at uh, six dollars a month, and now and then Deezer uh, reduced the price a little bit, so they're pretty much aligned in price now. Right. RDO is down to six dollars a month, also. What's that? Is RDO down to six dollars? Yeah, a month it's pretty much the same. It's pretty much the same. It's very similar. The only difference there is that uh, uh, Deezer is. Uh, these are in RDO actually. Well, no, these are the only product that's operated in local currency in reais. Only these. Right. right. So that puts them on a, on a better place than Spotify and RDO. Yeah. And so, um, Marcelo, uh, on that on that front, we're talking about uh, uh, services that are coming into Brazil without a telco deal, like Spotify. Right now, they just launched essentially in the country uh, without any tie-up. Uh, but we've also seen uh, services that are making uh, big plays on the carrier front. So we're seeing uh, Tim partnered with uh, Move Music uh, uh, last year, and we've also seen Napster replacing Sonora, Sonora as Telefonica's streaming service of choice. Uh, so, what what do you make of these partnerships, and do they have a, a better chance of of, uh, succeeding due to the the way people consuming uh, consume you know mobile contracts or anything like that it, do they have a better chance of succeeding than a service that just comes standalone and, and asks for a payment yeah they do uh, the, the the obvious uh, natural answer is that they do uh, the thing is that uh, of course vivo on one hand with uh, with Napster uh, they they are they start on a they have a very, very good uh, starting point because they right. had all the original subscriptions off of Sonora. Yes. At the same time, when Tim released the, the service with Move, the expectations were really high about that. Uh, something happened that said the numbers didn't go up as much as all of us and them expected to, right. to, uh, them to be. Uh, all the change in equity of Move now is probably going to have some impact in what they're doing, what team is doing, team is gonna have probably to to find a, a different way of uh, of uh, providing the service with all the changes that that are going on with moving the United States. But I mean, bundles are definitely a, a nice shortcut for all of these companies. Yeah. The and also together with the bundles, there's one major issue that has to be solved, which is networks. Networks in Brazil, broadbands and networks in Brazil are still very weak. So it's very hard for you to really uh, use a music streaming service uh, uh, in your car uh, right. and move. So uh, if you want to use something with your strong Wi-Fi on your desktop, okay, you're fine. But if you leave your house or, if you, or in your car, it's not going to work. Uh, well. and, and, and that's a very important point to make, of course, because uh, mobile uh, is one of the key reasons why people actually choose to uh, upgrade to Spotify Premium, uh, of course. And so, uh, although they can cash it on their phone, so that's that's also an element of that. Uh, and so, uh, Luciana, on, on what do you feel? Uh, how do you feel that services are? acting also Marcelo and, and Robert if you want to jump in on that how do you feel services that are coming in from abroad like Deezer uh, Spotify RDO uh, you know uh, moves music how are they licensing music uh, the local catalog are they quite diligent in coming to the independent sector and asking uh, you know for licenses and making sure that they have the entirety of the picture or uh, is there still a lot of work that needs to be done in making sure that the catalog they offer is, is complete with everything that you have as well I have a question of Luciana, and which is relevant in this as well. Sure. How is how has E Music have been doing? Because um, it's a, another domestic com company that I don't know, Andre, if, if you know them pretty well. But have they been doing well with their mobile uh, platforms? And in terms of licensing, of course, they've had a head start because they've licensed a lot of Brazilian content for many years now, um, and, and it is a local um, uh, business. How's that been faring as compared to the uh, uh, international services? 
I think we've lost Luciana. Uh, uh, yeah, Robert, I, I, I may jump in on this while Luciana thanks. gets back to us. Uh, Imuska, they have a, 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 have some news now. They've been sold to to America Module, so right. uh, this is a big change in what they, what's going to happen with the Imuska now. But still, they have two different sides of the business. Right. Today, they they operate on a very as a very strong. Uh, distributor for uh, the, the ring back tones and for content for uh, cell phone companies and ring back tones is today a very strong part of the business for us in Brazil and on the other hand they have a platform that works as a, as a white label for for Claro and that's pretty much uh, where their focus should be from now on because the, the, the whole uh, sale to, to to America Mobile is probably because they, they're going to focus on that. And uh, it's not that I, I don't see they competing with a Spotify or a Deezer. They will compete with the other cell phone companies that uh, uh, go for bundles like Vivo Napster, for instance. So that's right. probably where they're going to be. Yeah, and uh, Luciana, sorry, we lost you there for a second, and we we're talking about e-musica uh, oh. e and uh, what the role was. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, Marcelo pointed out that they've just been sold to uh, America Mobile, uh, so that's a big move for e-musica. Uh, but I wanted to also ask you. Uh, so on the, uh, I started to ask you earlier about uh, uh, international companies coming into Brazil. So how are they approaching the independent sector? Of course, you uh, are uh, in the thick of it when it comes to to that kind of uh, uh, those kind of deals. Uh, are, are they uh, coming in and wanting to license local content and and are they able to do so at, at a, uh, you know, in a reasonable uh, time frame? Yeah, they sure are. They're pretty aggressive on getting licensed from the independents. Uh, most of the independents don't license directly. They, they go through the aggregators. Right. Uh, uh, but they sure have all the content that's available in Brazil on the... Um, independent side, especially because today the, the majority of the produ production of Brazilian music is on the independent side. Right. So there's a lot of production going on, and so they really have to approach the independents as well as the, uh, the major companies. That's great to hear because I know that in, in you know that's not the same in, in all territories and some territories you know have mm -hmm. l less local catalog than others. But of course, uh, uh, we're talking about a country where uh, the latest stats I had were ninety percent of the uh, recorded music sales are local content. So that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, not there's one point of concern it's... for. Please go ahead, sir. No, it's not 90. It's uh, 75 to 80% right. is local music. Go ahead. And there's one big point of concern there about uh, the licensing of, uh, of bra Brazilian music, Brazilian content to those services. It's not about the, the license uh, itself. It's about uh, shelf space and then market share. Yeah. Because, I mean, even if you have all of the content in all the services, if you go uh, in... in navigate and browse a little bit on the initial pages of most of the of the services you're not going to find too much brazilian content in there and then there's the big concern about what is the kind of negotiation that the majors have with the services about minimum market share so this is uh, one concern that we're, we're going to have to to have uh, pretty much all the time yeah it's no one, one, mm -hmm. one other thing that i found difficult actually on, on the publishing side is trying to license the publishing rights because there are nine or more real PROs in performing rights organizations in Brazil and I, I know for iTunes and for some of the streaming services the label side became a little bit more simple than the, than the publishing side. It was, right. it was very difficult for us to license uh, uh, the, the lyric rights and, and lyric line because of the different PROs and in, in essence the competition and the uh, um, the lack of a, a central licensing mode, which seems to be much simpler on the labor side at this point. Right, exactly. And so on the licensing front, mm. uh, uh, Luciana, how does it work? What are the key societies to, to look out for if somebody that was listening to the show was interested in, listen, in, in licensing music uh, from Brazil? Well, on the, on the publishing side, for streaming services, uh, people have to talk to the publishers, not to the societies right uh, so there are 
a few. Uh, the major one is uh, called UBEM, and they have evolved a lot on the licensing side. They Today they have uh, contracts with the same percentage of, of uh, licensing deals to everyone, so it's not as difficult as it used to be one year, two years ago. Yeah. Uh, and there are several smaller ones, and they're struggling to receive money from the services because they don't have a, 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 a association or whatever that could receive that money from them. And they're, they're missing the infrastructure so, as well to calculate what they what you know to, to get the reports as well. I, I imagine. Yeah, exactly. That's a big problem that UBEN have already solved, but the smaller independent. Uh, publishers have not yet and that's something that ABMI is starting to talk about maybe we can deliver that structure uh, to serve them so we are talking about that and on the uh, label side um, it's I think it's pretty easy because the the aggregators especially they are pretty aggressive in the, in the market and they are signing everyone right so uh, we here we have um, the Orchard, Believe, One RPM, and CD Baby, they you know, they might have 90% of the whole indie con uh, content, so I think it, it's pretty easy. And yeah. for the bigger companies like Son Livre and DEC and, and other bigger ones, uh, they have some direct contract with some of the services. So it's not really complicated today as it used to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Marcelo, uh, so so yeah, some Libre, of course, had that you have your own publishing uh, uh, arm, and and you actually enter the company through the publishing process. How did you find that experience of actually having to administer everything at your end? It was very a very teaching experience. I mean, I, I learned a lot. It was a very good school to, to, to come in the market for the first time because, I mean, knowing knowing from the from the start to, to know uh, the company and the market uh, on the publishing side and the licensing and the ways that the music licensing works and the, the, the whole separation of uh, ways of dealing between publishings and masters it was it was a very very good school i i doubt i could have a better one in coming to the market yes absolutely and uh, so robert uh, what is the reaction of uh, uh, people that are wanting to get into the brazilian market you know i'm sure you talk to, you talk to these kind of uh, uh, companies all the time uh, uh, to the, the structure of the, of the licensing framework do they find it easy hard to navigate uh, uh, how do they approach that well, like Luciana said, I think it, it is getting better. Um, um, you know, maybe a year and a half or ago, or two years ago, with uh, Ubain was was much more difficult than now. Um, you know, believe uh, spent some time uh, coming into the market. Spotify was here, was in Brazil for what at least a year before they actually launched. Um, um, you know, it, it is it's it's its own. Um, uh, ecosystem. It's very different yeah. from, from everywhere else. Uh, I think Deezer probably came in more quickly than, than anyone or maybe RDO, but um, you know, everybody is interested in Brazil, but they have to realize it's a completely different market from uh, you know, the US, the UK, um, Argentina, or Portugal. You know, it's, a, it's, it's its own market and, and actually each state, each province, each area of Brazil has its own Kind of specialties and its own uh, musical tastes, and and the market of Brazil is is, is a market that, you know internally in Brazil that that you know you kind of have to really be there to to know well. So if you're trying to sell Brazilian music in Brazil and you're an international company, you have to have experts who really know the <coughs> Brazilian music scene yeah. very well. Yeah, absolutely. And Mar Marcelo, one of the things that I couldn't quite understand of, of the Brazilian market, you, you should explain it to us, uh, is that I read uh, that uh, music videos were one of the biggest uh, earners for the Brazilian music industry for, for quite a few years. Uh, but I, I wasn't quite clear on, on what kind of sales those music videos were generated. Were generating. Are, are we talking about DVDs or are we talking about uh, what was the, the revenue, where was the revenue coming from there? Yeah, well, there are many, many, well, not many, I would say two main uh, sources of revenue for videos. DVDs definitely are a huge market in Brazil. Probably, right. uh, 
proportionally Brazil probably has the strongest market for DVDs in the world uh, if compared to the site size of uh, of the market of CDs uh, until last year I'm, I'm I don't have the the number the exact number here but I would say that last year we had something like 45 percent of the market uh, wow. of physical market was in DVDs uh, and th there's uh, it's hard to explain and uh, we keep trying to create an explanation and to understand what what goes on about this and something about the public being visual or wanting to to bring the the live experience to their living rooms something about that something about the, the explosion of dvd players in cars uh, so that's the kind of uh, content more easily available in cars for most of the population so there there's probably a combination of all of that yeah and for since two years now uh, YouTube is also a very a, a nice source of revenues for for the market yeah. uh, and today YouTube is much larger than iTunes in uh, in Brazil for I would say all of the labels here so that's uh, and it, it's uh, an interesting thing because we're talking about all of that generation that uh, never never understood that they had to pay for digital music and YouTube is a perfect uh, uh, fit to that situation because it's music for free that for uh, it somehow uh, brings some kind of good money for the labels yeah and so it's a good it's a good way of using it and so it must be kind of a strange you must be caught between a rock and a hard place in a sense it's it's an, it's an english saying in the sense that uh, you know youtube has been really good and it's, it's generating revenues that were the, otherwise not there because people are accessing accessing music uh, on the web anyway but at the same time i know luciana that uh, 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 you know, your organization, uh, uh, ABMI, uh, stood with a win last week uh, when uh, there was a statement released around uh, uh, the uh, uh, license fees that were being offered uh, uh, by YouTube uh, mm. for their streaming service and, and that they were, they were not being equitable, that they were offering less than what other services are offering uh, on the market. So uh, how, do you, how do you balance those two uh, issues? I guess the fact that uh, YouTube is really good for, for the market because it is bringing in revenues that are not there otherwise, but also the fact that YouTube is leveraging its position in order to get a you know a much better deal than other companies have managed to get so far. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the problem because on one side they're giving such good revenue to the market that doesn't mean that they can jeopardize the whole market by offering a lower royalty on licensing the the streaming service. That's why a label cannot do that by standing uh, against uh, Google, but the association can, and yeah. especially if we, if we gather together uh, under the WIN umbrella, and and all over the world, we sent out a manifesto, and everyone stood against that that um, way of behaving because I, I think it was pretty bad business behavior. Yeah, uh, if you. Do you you can you can't sign you can't stay stay into YouTube if you don't sign the streaming service on on my terms. So yeah, it, it was not nice. So we had to to speak out. Yes, absolutely, Robert. Yeah. Uh, Robert, from from our side perspective, uh, speaking from from New York, you know, what do you make of the situation with Win? And uh, do you feel like YouTube now is going to get uh, is going to really have the, the pressure on because they've had such a such a big reaction from all the organizations around the world? Well, I hope so. Um, you know, Google is uh, you know a mammoth um, company, and uh, it's hard to bite the hand that feeds you. But at yeah. the same time, Google is. You know, I mean, YouTube is cannibalizing other sources of income. Um, you know, of, of course, uh, download sales and uh, before that, CD sales and probably even radio broadcast uh, income, neighboring rights and, and publishing. So, you know, uh, just like uh, uh, the industry always has to fight for its rights to uh, party, as the BC Boys used to say, but fight for its rights to uh, maintain a, a, you know, a, a, a a level of, of income and a level of negotiating power that's equitable, uh, they have to fight with Google, which is not an easy thing to do uh, at this point. Um, yeah. You know, uh, so, so I, I do believe um, that 
that it, that it is important for um, companies, organizations, and um, uh, also the governments behind the companies and organizations who are behind protecting IP and know that the creative economy has to keep moving yeah. to not give way to the uh, technology that you know then uh, diminishes the rights of the creative economy. So it's it's always a balance, uh, and it's it's definitely not an easy thing. Um, but uh, you know, I, I hope that the the balance, you know, with the governments behind it, with the organizations, and with the creators, with the artists and musicians, the songwriters, the publishers, and the labels, actually can, you know, influence as they always have. I mean, you know, the uh, ASCAP, BMI, uh, um, all the PROs around the world, you know, uh, helped create the whole concept of copyright back in the early 1900s. So. So I think that it's uh, you know something that's an ongoing battle uh, you know especially in the digital sense with uh, zeros and ones uh, and information being able to be copied so easily uh, it's it's a battle that's going to last uh, you know for another ten twenty thirty years and yeah. that that everybody has to be vigilant about. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's going to be a very interesting issue to see how how that develops in the next uh, uh, few months, actually, because YouTube wants to launch a service and are going to have a very hard time to launch it. Uh, perhaps they could launch it without the independence uh, from Brazil, but they definitely couldn't launch it without uh, some some of the independence from the UK, for well, example. And yeah, and so well. yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have to really see what happens uh, there because everybody's standing together, and so it makes a much more uh, compact front on a worldwide uh, on a worldwide level. And uh, uh, Luciana, I wanted to ask you about uh, you know you were at the uh, spearheading uh, uh, sort of. Uh, uh, talks uh, that resulted eventually, or at least you were supporting an initiative that uh, uh, resulted in a constitutional amendment in Brazil that passed in September of last year, uh, which uh, meant that uh, uh, CDs and DVDs produced in Brazil uh, featuring Brazilian performers, uh, performers are sold tax-free now. So uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how that came together and, and uh, what that means for the local industry as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was proposed by BMI uh, several years ago, and it took too long to to pass. It was yeah. really difficult and time-consuming and effort. And I'm really glad <laughs> we are through with it because it took took us a lot of energy. Right. Um, and it would would have been been more important seven years ago when we started that. Uh, because the CDs were pretty strong uh, back then, yeah. they are not anymore. But still, uh, this is a, a good thing, especially for small producers that don't deliver f uh, from... Well, that's something um, I'll have to explain because it's sure, pretty yeah, complicated. Yeah, in, yeah. in the Amazon forest, we have, uh, we have a, a free zone for industrial products. It uh, was built there because they wanted to, to give some jobs to the people in the forest so that they wouldn't be cutting woods and destroying the forest. Uh, but it's really complicated to bring anything from there. So right. they have lots of tax um, free um, goods. Goods, I guess, yeah. Yeah, well. So uh, the major companies and the bigger companies like Son Livre, they, they uh, print CDs and DVDs and they deliver a distribute from that area. Right. And so they don't have those taxes anyway from ah, delivering from there. I see. But the smaller labels, they distribute or from their, their own cities or from Sao Paulo or from someplace else. Yeah. And that was really complicated because we pay taxes before we sell the, the product. Wow, we, we and that's 25%? The, when, that's, uh, well, some, uh, 18, 19% right. that we, we have to, to, when we deliver a product to another state, we have to pay taxes before we send it out. Wow. So it's, <laughs> it was killing, it was killing the indie. Yeah. companies because it's too much money to to be putting before receiving the uh, a payment so that that made it much better for for the the medium and smaller uh companies to work with the physical cds there are, are they still sell in brazil but seven years from from now it wouldn't would have been a really big deal yeah now exactly. it's just it's good. Some 
save some money and save some employees and save some work. Um, but it's still good to have some some uh, some different uh, the, uh, ways of developing Brazilian music Absolutely. from the smaller uh, label side. Yeah. And that, that's really important, you know, any money that you can get these days is, is good. So, especially for mm -hmm. the smaller independents. So, uh, no, congratulations on, yeah. on working on that and getting that, and getting that passed. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, Marcelo, uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, licensing. So, uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, Son Libre has uh, a vast catalog of artists. Uh, a few of them have had hits uh, internationally as well. Of course, uh, the one everybody will know is uh, Michel Tello, uh, I Say To Epego, uh, which was a huge worldwide hit uh, in the last couple of years. And so, uh, when that happened, did you already have a, a big network of uh, uh, people, licensees and people that could help you uh, distribute the track and make sure that you made the most out of the momentum of, of the release? Or did you have to develop things in a hurry to, to make sure that you get, could get it out as soon as possible? Well, it was half and half. We had right. we had some network of uh, of uh, uh, licenses that uh, could use and uh, could take advantage of that moment. At, at the same time, uh, most of the companies we work uh, with outside Brazil are small companies uh, are focused on a different kind of music. Right. For that kind of uh, uh, of hit of a smash hit like uh, Michel Tello, and then we had also Gustavo Lima with uh, Che Chirere, which was another uh, huge thing. Uh, we needed different kinds of companies, so we had to adjust uh, the companies we were licensing to to make sure that those companies could make the the, the uh, reach the better result yeah. for those songs. So pretty much what happens is uh, for for that uh, out licensing, we had to we have to all the time adapt the the kind of network and the kind of. Uh, partners that we use depending yeah. on, the, on the kind of music and the kind of market that we want to reach so yeah. uh, we work with different kinds of networks there and, and you also you you close the uh, sub publishing agreement with uh, BMG uh, back in December uh, covering North America Israel and most of uh, uh, the European territories so ha has that partnership in the last uh, sort of eight months uh, been beneficial for you guys especially considering the run-up to the World Cup it's still it's still early to say something about that. So most of uh, of what we have uh, going on with PMG, I'm very optimistic about where we can go. The thing is, uh, there are two different uh, kinds of uh, area and of uh, uh, business that we expect from BMG. There's uh, one thing about recouping and uh, and lifting all the money that we know for a fact that uh, is available for our catalog in many countries outside Brazil. And there's the second thing, which is to, to create value for the Brazilian music and Brazilian content that we own on those countries, new value and new opportunities for that catalog. Yeah. Uh, for us to, to work with a BMG is important in the sense that uh, uh, we had an experience of working with a major that had their own Brazilian content, so our obvious conclusion there was that uh, in any way or any uh, moment that uh, some opportunity raised uh, arose for uh, uh, for some Brazilian music and for some Brazilian song, uh, uh, a major will always uh, favor their own uh, Brazilian music uh, as opposed to ours. So with PMG, when they don't have any other strong Brazilian catalog. It's very important for us to be the prime Brazilian content for them. Exactly. So that when, when the sync pitch comes in, you're the first in line. Exactly. And, uh, yes. <laughs> and so, uh, of course, uh, I wanted to spend the last few minutes uh, of the show talking about uh, the World Cup, which is uh, coming up in the next few days. So, Robert, I want to start with your international perspective uh, on that. Uh, so, have you seen uh, interest in Brazilian music increase uh, over the last uh, uh, sort of two years uh, in the run up to the World Cup? And how have you seen the, the international market? Uh, uh, react to this event that's, that's coming up uh, very soon. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's been people for the last two years interested, and in, of course, there's the Olympics uh, after the World Cup, so and everybody yeah. knows that. And I'm speaking mostly about the um, big brands and the companies that do, deal with synchronization. Um, but just generally in the world, there's uh, there's more of a influence uh, from Brazil and more of a awareness about Brazil. I mean. 
some of it was uh, maybe on the negative sense fairly recently with the riots and the, and the protests and all that. But of course, there are protests in New York City as well and, and all around the world. Um, uh, you know, in the same period. Um, but but even that, uh, you know, it's, it's you know, Brazil is is front page news, and uh, you know, that's good for Brazilian music around the world. And I think people are um, getting an idea that. Brazilian music is is a very vast and very uh, um, kind of a huge repository of different kinds of musical styles, and uh, you know a lot of the music from Som Livre, for example, still isn't really known beyond Brazil because it's it's uh, it's, it's music for the people. I mean, the the bad English translation is country music, but it doesn't really mean anything like American country music or any other country music from any other. Uh, country really, uh, except that it's music of the people for the people, and um, and and you know you, you really need to kind of understand the culture and the language to to be able to appreciate it, and also all the the religious music of Brazil, which is uh, a, a huge market in Brazil, but has not been able to uh, get beyond Brazil. Yeah. But then there's companies like Coca Cola, you know, and music dealers who are doing I don't know something like 27 events during the World Cup and. You know, trying to, uh, you know, to to find the you know Brazilian music to export as well. I know Roger was signed um, by um, uh, Seymour Stein, and he's an ESPN um, kind of official artist for the, for the World Cup. Uh, and you know, yeah, you know, everybody's been talking about the World Cup and Brazil and the Olympics afterwards. And I think mostly the brands are orienting uh, towards it. Yeah. Um, you know. It's it has it has been a, I think a, a major factor in the interest in Brazil worldwide. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, so, Luciana, from from your perspective, uh, uh, do you feel like uh, you know that there's there have been a, a few uh, sort of uh, uh, slightly more negative articles around the, the tracks that have been chosen and the fact that there there wasn't a huge amount of Brazilian artist representation at the World Cup? Uh, do you feel like that's just because the World Cup is such a commercial event and perhaps the Olympics the Olympics are going to be a completely different story when it comes to that, uh, or do you feel that that's a misre misrepresentation and actually there has been a fairly decent uh, showing of of Brazilian artists uh, involved? in the World Cup and, and that's been beneficial for, for the industry there? I, I don't think so. I think it's a commercial thing and, and they will always uh, choose for more commercial music. Yeah. But ha there have been several very good opportunities for the, the indie sector on, on this area because of Brazil is such a spotlight these that's days. Great. So we've, we've been featured at Medem, uh, we've been featured Right now, it's it's going on a a, a award uh, in Spain, and there is a Brazilian category because of the World Cup. So many things because of the World Cup. Last year, uh, EA, the, the video game company, came to pitch music from my members, and they licensed more than nine nine or some so so uh, music from my members. So so there. Are Several opportunities that are not on the the, the main uh, TV ads or anything, but they're uh, becoming revenue for for the independent sector. So I think uh, it's been positive. That's great. The, the World Cup and and then we still have the Olympics. So course, yeah. anything that we didn't take advantage now for the World Cup, we still have two years for the the Olympic Games. Yeah. So and we are working a lot uh, on with our export office, and we are building. Uh, ADMI has this seminar that took place last year in April. This year will be in September uh, because it had to be after the World Cup because before is everything so expensive and so confusing. <laughs> but after that, so we are. I'm going to New York next next week. Uh, to promote the to, to participate on on Merlin and we meetings and of course, in, yeah. it, in the music week uh, music week and also to promote the the venue so because we want a lot of uh, business partners partners from outside Brazil coming here because last year was really great for business for everyone yeah so we're That's doing great. as much as we can to to be international <laughs> to make Brazilian music. 
awareness outside Brazil. That's fantastic. And, you know, I had to address it just because uh, uh, there was an article just published just a few, just a few hours ago on Billboard, uh, which uh, it was titled uh, World Cup, Where is the Real Brazilian Music? So I thought I'd bring it up and, and we'll have a chat about it. So, uh, Marcelo, from, from your end, uh, you have uh, uh, an artist that managed to make uh, her way into uh, uh, the, one of the key tracks of, of the World Cup, uh, which is We Are One with uh, uh, Jennifer Lopez and uh, Pitbull. So, so how, what's the story behind that and, and how did that happen? Well, that, not much to tell about that. The, sure. the thing is that, the, well, the, the official World Cup label is, uh, is Sony. So when you have uh, your competitors, uh, the, the official label for, for the event, <laughs> you cannot expect too much of yeah. it, right? But at the same time, I mean, Claudia, the, the artist in, in, uh, in question, uh, she's, she's a great artist. And uh, at the point where uh, they needed someone with this uh, local feel and with this uh, local, uh, the, the Brazilian artist that could really add to the track with uh, with Sony artists. I guess they they uh, they saw what was pretty obvious that Claudia Leite was uh, the most popular. Uh, she's very talented. She's beautiful. She, she's a great singer. Uh, she has a, a, a huge uh, base of fans. So it was pretty obvious. To, to Sony that uh, the, the, the invitation for Claudia Late was, was a good one and uh, yep. I, I think she did a great job. That's great. That's fantastic to hear. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, yeah, that, well, I think we're getting to the end of it. But I just wanted to close with a quick question around live music. It's something that we haven't really touched upon today. But uh, just a quick round uh, uh, from everybody to hear uh, what your thoughts are. So, uh, is there uh, a large market for independent music in Brazil? Uh, and uh, are people used to going to you know to gigs uh, all the time? You know, how does it work? Or is it more central around big, bigger events? Uh, uh, so, uh, a quick uh, answer on on what your take is, uh, Marcelo, First of all. Well, I think probably for for the the smaller acts and for the the independent acts, probably the live business is uh, on on the one hand is uh, the place where the artists have to more flexibility more flexibility to work on and more options to to go about. And on the other hand, it's probably the most difficult section of the market to, to make money off. Right. Uh, Luciana can tell a little better uh, about this, but there are some uh, good opportunities in terms of incentives for uh, 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 government uh, uh, plans for incentives for, for tours and everything. So that's probably one good place that uh, an independent artist can, can look for. But today we can say that the, the market, the, the live business is really, really focused in, uh, in, in large acts today. In right. Brazil. Right. Luciana, uh -huh. on, on your end, you know, I read also that it's uh, one of the key problems of live music is the fact that the country is so large. So for a, a smaller independent artist, it's very hard to f make a tour work financially, right? It is. Yeah, yeah. There are much more very good artists and there are places to play. So it's pretty difficult. Uh, the live markets is is uh, hot today, but for bigger acts and for uh, festivals and international music and uh, Brazilians like a lot to go to, to concerts. Right. But there's a, a group of artists. They are not, they did not, uh, belong to the old um, business, to, to, to the old music business. So they didn't profit from, from being famous by that time. So they started after that. And they are not too popular. Uh, they don't play very popular music. They play uh, more sophisticated music. Right. So they, they are restricted to some, some circuits of uh, small festivals or even big festivals, but if they're if they don't have big names, they don't have big pay. Yeah. Uh, and some smaller um, networks of of concert halls, we have several here, and they pay uh, a good fee. Yeah. But there are so many artists, and and they can't be. Uh, uh, doing the same artists every year, so yeah. it makes very s small space uh, for a large amount of the, 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 the artists there are around. Yeah. So it's, a, it's good revenue, but not for everyone. Yeah, 
Yeah, and and Robert, finally, uh, you know, uh, is there interest in bringing artists outside of Brazil uh, into the U.S. to play, or is it too costly? Uh, are the people that are working on that? People working on it, especially the artists, because they do actually want to tour the U.S. or tour Europe or go to Japan and perform abroad. And uh, you know, I think that's uh, growing and growing and growing. Uh, you know, there's more and more artists. Uh, you know, first of all, which isn't my recommendation, but there's a lot of artists also singing in English, so uh, you know they can, can can deal with the anglophone markets around the world. Um, uh, but they're also you know in the world music space and the jazz space and the classical music uh, area. Uh, you know, South by Southwest was a big f focus of Apex, the trade office this year, music and digital. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, there are a lot of the Brazilian artists that <clears throat> we work with abroad also do have a. <clears throat> Excuse me, a, a strong work. touring schedule in in Brazil, and you know, as Luciana said, there are supports from the Sesc uh, uh, halls and from Foro do Hecho and from different areas. And there are there is a lot of festivals in, in Brazil, so it's kind of a decision for the Brazilian artists as to whether or not and how much they want to focus their investment outside of Brazil or inside of Brazil. Yeah, uh, and that and that's to a large degree based on you know the type of music they do and, and whether or not they think they're going to have a, a market overseas or could have a market overseas but there are you know many Brazilian artists touring all the time overseas although it is probably um, uh, you know it, it will develop more and more in the future and it, it be mainly in my opinion because of the language unless you're kind of a world music artist um, uh, you know it still has a, a long way t to go and to grow and uh, you know, I, I I believe it will. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's fantastic to hear, and uh, uh, you know, it, it's such a pleasure talking to you all today. And I could I could spend a, a, a lot longer with you, but uh, I know you'll have to go. And uh, 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 thanks so much uh, uh, from uh, uh, Rio or Marcelo. And uh, 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 you know, it was a pleasure having you. So uh, the site for uh, Som Livre, if you want to find uh, more, is uh, uh, somlivre dot com. Uh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. That's right. Uh, so you can go and find all the catalog uh, of the company uh, there. And uh, Luciana, again, uh, you're, you're also in Rio today, right? I'm in Rio. Oh, actually, I'm in Rio State, but uh, right. in a, another town. Okay, cool. Nice. And yeah. so, uh, again, uh, it's uh, uh, Delira Musica, and uh, you can find uh, the website at uh, deliramusica.com. I will throw all the links in the show notes. And uh, Robert uh, from New York, uh, thanks so much for joining us as well. Uh, where can people uh, find uh, your work? Is there a company you particularly want to highlight or direct people to? Well, Brazil Music Exchange in terms of Brazil, but uh, so Lyric Find and Dot Music and there's some other ones. But also, I, I do want to encourage everybody to come to Brazil in September for the ABMI event. I was at, at the first one. There's a U.S. trade mission as well from ABMI right. uh, this year, and there was last year. And you know, for the first event, it was a phenomenal success. I think from the Brazilians and the international people there, it was really, really strong. Event so uh, in mid September I think it starts at what's twenty second Luciana something like that twenty twenty four twenty four to twenty six in Rio in September it's called Rio Music Bus okay fantastic well uh, I probably won't be able to make it down there but I will be very happy to cover it from afar and uh, have some people come and talk about it uh, when the time comes and uh, once again thanks so much for joining me uh, it was a real pleasure and thanks so much for listening to this special edition of Digital Music Trends on Brazil I hope you really enjoyed it and uh, you can uh, I hope you'll enjoy watching the World Cup as well uh, starting this week and uh, uh, thanks so much for listening you can find out everything on digitalmusictrends.com have a fantastic week and until uh, next time.